Yeah. Let's uh, let's get started here. Um, real quick, if you haven't seen Todd's stuff or read his books, we'll do a quick intro and then we're going to get into it. Um, Todd is the author of one of my favorite books, Transparency Sale. And Todd, let me know when this next book's coming out. It might already be scheduled. We talked about that, but you're coming out with a book, Transparent Sales Leader, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, he does all kinds of good stuff at sales mail and he, he has experience in multiple VP of sales roles. He's been a chief revenue officer and uh, Todd, you're someone that I always like going to for advice when it comes to the topic that we're going to be talking about today. Um, recessions, how to sell through them, how to prepare for them, that sort of thing. So it's, uh, it's always good to jam with you, my friend. Dude, thanks for having me. And I'm, I'm always good for a good rant. So, uh, like we'll have a few of those today too. So when's the, when's the new book coming out though? All right. So, um, this economy and like printing issues have slowed everything down. Um, and so we're going to do a soft launch on July 5th. So Kindle, and then we did a short run of print on demands paperback. Um, and then we're going to do a fuller launch in September, October, where we're doing the, the big, you know, massive print. We're going to do hard covers and, uh, Brandon, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find a studio in Chicago that will do an audio, like will record with me. Last time I did it with, at a music studio and like these guys were like, Hey, can you come at like 11 o'clock at night? Cause that's when the music guys are recording. I'm like, how about eight in the morning? Like, what? Like there, there's an eight in the yeah. morning. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to find a place, but I'm, I'm going to record the audio book as soon as I can find a studio and get in and do it, but it'll be Kindle paperback on July 5th. Um, you can pre-order the Kindle right now. Tomorrow, Amazon will launch the paperback page because we weren't expecting to have to do that. And you'll be able to pre-order that one. So it'll be fun. Awesome. Well, if you're on this webinar, you're definitely going to get an email from me, you know, about it. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll definitely make sure to let you all know. Um, so we're talking about the recession today and we had talked before we hopped on I get, I'm getting really kind of mixed messaging from my clients around the summer on top of it and already proactively thinking about it. They're preparing their reps. And then some people are not talking about it at all. Right. Yeah. So from your standpoint, obviously neither of us are economists or any you know thing right. like that, but I know yeah. that you're a big history buff and uh, especially having been through this and having, having led a team through it, there's some patterns and, and, you know, that kind of stuff. You want to start with just kind of the history lesson behind this? Like, yeah. how, well, why yeah. should we be worried right now? I guess is the big thing. Why, why should we even care about this? Well, I'll tell you what punched me in the face um, back in January. So like for anybody who just joined late, I'm a sales history nerd, right? Like I, when cool people are doing cool stuff on the weekends, I'm reading old sales books from the early 1900s. Um, I was reading one from 1926 and it, was talking about salesperson turnover. And I noticed something crazy that from like 1919 to 1922, turnover was really high, like off the charts high. And so I started reading about it and like reading the why. And I was like, is this 1922 or 2022? Like it, it sounded like it was describing yeah. the eight years leading up to now, but a hundred years ago. And, and what I mean by that, and, and by the way, I mean, it struck me that holy crap, like, could this happen again? Because we, as an economy and as a sales profession, tend to step on the same rake over and over again. Um, so yeah. but here, here was the, the story, though. From, like, 1915 to 1917, we were experiencing steady growth as an economy, right? Like, people weren't really worried about the economy. It was going pretty well. And that was what we were experiencing here from, like, 2015 to 2020. Like, slow, slow steady growth. And then in 1918, there was a cataclysmic event that shut down the economy for a short period of time, right? Much like COVID, we entered World War I and the whole economy stopped. And, oh, there happened to be also a pandemic called the Spanish flu in 1918. What's weird about that is nobody gave a crap. Like literally none of my magazines even mentioned pandemic, which is nuts. They just ignored it. Like, eh. Uh, but economy shuts down for a short period of time. And then... It roars like it goes freaking nuts uh, that sales leaders couldn't hire salespeople fast enough. Sounds like late 2020, early in all of 2021. And there was something that like we called the great resignation back then, but it was happening then where sales 
leaders couldn't hold on to their salespeople. They were chasing money. They were going all, there were so many jobs open and not enough people that they just kept like going. And then there was an inflation spike, massive inflation. They called it devastating inflation in 1920 of 7%. That was devastating. You know, March of 2022. So three months ago, we hit eight and a half percent. And then the bottom dropped out, right? The bottom dropped out, meaning the economy just went and sales leaders started purging salespeople. 1921, the sales community experienced 77% turnover. And that was involuntary, meaning time oh. to go. Didn't get better in 1922, 85% involuntary turnover, right? And so I looked at that and I looked at that whole run-up and like you kind of throw in a disruption in the relationships in Europe and like it's it's a recipe for messiness. So I kept digging yeah. and really when you look at it, like every time that we've experienced high growth inflation spike, we followed it up with a recession. Always, like every time never not happened. And so I just, I don't see how we avoid it. And we're already starting to see it. We see companies laying off chunks of their teams. And if they're not doing it yet, everybody's thinking about it. And that therein lies the opportunity for salespeople. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought when you were saying that. So what was it like if we kind of start in today for the rest of you guys, what we're going to do is um, I'm just trying to unpack a little bit of what Todd's you know kind of learned. We'll kind of start with the team that you led through the, the, the prior recession. And then also we're going to share three strategies with you guys on how you can prepare. And these are very tactical sort of stuff. So we'll kind of get there throughout this. Um, bring us back to 2008, 2009. You're running a sales team, the financial crisis mm -hmm. leading up to that. What was kind of the rumblings leading up to that. Yeah, and how did you guys prepare for it? If you could unpack that story, I think that's well, that's just a great one for folks. Yeah, and, and by the way, um, the, the one before it, so 2000, 2001, like we had hit a peak economy in March of 2000. It all started dropping and then September 11th happened and the bottom fell out. I was one of the sales reps rift, you know, laid off from a company. So I've experienced it as a salesperson. Oh, wow. Um, and the reason that I experienced it as a salesperson is that our solution and our messaging was purely, this is cool. This is nice to have stuff. And like, we're going to talk about that gets cut first. Uh, fast forward though, to 2008, 2009, um, I was leading a team and we were struggling. Like we were really, really struggling. Right. And um, we'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it when we go through the kind of the three things that you can do. But the things that we did are pretty counterintuitive to what you might be thinking, right? And what I mean by that is it, it takes you really getting to clinical levels of empathy with what buyers are experiencing, right? So buyers, for example, just think about all of you on the, the call here. When, when you hit a personal recession, so in your personal life, when you're unsure what's coming, either financially or in any respect, like, what do you do? You probably let's do ask him things. in the chat, actually. Let's, well, let's yeah, I mean, I'll, 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 give you yeah. the, I'll give you the answers because we all do the <laughs> same three things. Yeah. Number one is all of you, when you start to see uncertainty or personal recession, um, Callie writes, you know, stop buying everything and eat ramen noodles. <laughs> that's, that's right on. <laughs> but like, number one thing you do is you, you, um, reduce your discretionary spending, right? Like, Hey, you know what? I need a gallon of milk. Am I going to go to whole foods? or Am I going to go to Aldi? Right? Like it's still a milk came from a cow, but one costs $4 less than the other. I'm going to Aldi, right? Uh, the personal trainer I was thinking about, yeah, I'm probably going to put that off that new couch. Uh, because my, my dog just, Went potty on it, Jason. Sorry to hit home with that one. Although uh, yours yeah. didn't go on the couch, which is nice. But like the new couch that you might need, you, you start to put that off, right? So number one, reduce discretionary spending. Number two is we start to look for ways to reduce costs on the things that we need, right? And that's like, the, that's the milk analogy, right? Like Whole Foods or Aldi, um, but it's for everything. Uh, yesterday, I was keynoting an event here in Chicago and afterwards, I hung out with a partner at a private equity firm for a little while. I don't know if you guys know Doug Landis. He's fantastic. I love that dude. 
Um, but he was talking about like, hey, they're informing their portfolio companies right now to find 20 to 30%. But that's what we do personally too, right? We, we start to look for ways like the things that we need, how can we get those costs down? And then number three is we look to extend our runway on the things we know we're going to need. And if you need any evidence of that, go back to March 2020 and check out the lines over at Costco or your local Target where people are freaking beating each other up over two-ply toilet paper, right? Like, I'm going to need a toilet. I can't, can't go another day without toilet paper, right? Like, that becomes a thing that you need that you're extending your runway on. We start to hoard a little bit. Well, that's the lesson for everyone to think about is... You do that personally at a subconscious level. Your buyers are humans. They're all doing it in their companies. And if they're not even thinking outside their own little bubble, their executives are telling them to do that, right? Reduce discretionary cost. Look for ways to cut maybe 20 to 30%. And then let's extend our runway where we can on certain things, especially if it helps us not only make sure that we've got what we need to get through this, because it always comes back, right? We will recover. Um, the end is not near, but uh, make sure that we look for ways to extend that runway and reduce cost on those things that we're going to do. So that's that's the way that we thought about it in 2008 is like, let's empathize with the buyers. They're all experiencing that. They're all thinking that. Let's adjust our approach to make sure that we're aligning with the, the things that are truly priorities in their world. Yeah. I'd like to prompt the audience with a question. What... What have you heard about recession related stuff? Could you drop it into the chat? So have your prospects maybe started sharing stuff? Let us know in the chat. Have you heard internal rumblings in your company? Or if you haven't heard anything, let us know in that in the chat too. I want to see what yeah, people are getting laid off. Hiring is slowing. Yes. Layoffs, even the best salespeople. Yeah. You're starting to see it. And you know, while you're doing that, um, one of the things that, um, I was, I was reading about, and I wrote about in the new book too, because uh, it's so crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, in Japan, so if you're on death row in Japan, so imagine you've been sentenced to death in Japan and you're on death row. So you're in these cells, you know, they don't tell you when it's coming in Japan. Like they don't tell you, Hey, today is going to be the day. That uncertainty is a crazy maker for all of our brains. But imagine every night when you go to bed, you wake up the next day going, is today going to be the day? Like, holy crap. As crazy as that sounds, can you believe that last year, those death row inmates all got together with their lawyers and they filed a class action lawsuit saying that that uncertainty is inhumane. They're on death row, right? But the uncertainty was the inhumane part and they sued. Now, the reason I say that is like, you know, for any leaders that are on the phone um, or on the call here, just realize that that uncertainty is a crazy maker for our brains, for your teams. And like, go tell your leaders this, if, you, if you're not one that, listen, help everyone predict, right? That like, don't pretend like nothing's going on. And then all of a sudden you're, you know, you're as a rep, you go to bed at night thinking, is tomorrow the day I'm going to be rift, right? You don't sleep as well. You don't perform as well. You're less creative. Your IQ goes down. So leaders, create certainty where you can right? Cards face up, transparent. Hey, here's where things are good. Here's what we're keeping an eye on, right? So, and th this is our strategy at this point, but it could change. So every Tuesday at two o'clock, we're going to get on a call together and I'm going to give you an update so that they at least know when they can predict. They can predict. There's regularity and certainty that calms all waters, increases our IQs. We sleep better. We perform better. We're more creative, which is so important in sales. And uh, I, I think a lot of sales leaders right now are treating their reps like Japanese death row inmates, where it's just like, hey, tomorrow could be the day. I'm not going to tell you. Right. And that's no way to live. And then there's a fear around not talking about it, too. Our, yeah. There's a fear oh, and, and Lydia, Lydia wrote, just uh, mentioned uh, uh, Tonga's 10% uh, reduction in staff shouldn't be considered a layoff. I, I don't know if you saw on his string that he and I had a quite a... Uh, exchange at the end of it, his Twitter string on that. So if you're, if you want to nerd out, but I was telling him about the, uh, what happened a hundred years ago. And he's like, where did you get that data? And like, we were going back and forth on it. So that's a side note, but yeah, yeah you know, um, bad news delivered is better than no news in the minds of the human being. 
right? Like uncertainty. Yeah. It's like anybody who's, you, you got an illness and you go to the doctor and we're like, we don't know what it is, right? That'll drive you crazy. If they know what it is and it's bad news and they can plan around it, you actually sleep better at night and it's better for your health, right? And that's the way that we all need to be thinking about if you're on the leadership side, especially is pretending like nothing's going on and going, hey, we don't know, right? That's going to drive people crazy, right? At least could yeah. come up with a plan, worst case scenario, and just over communicate during periods like this. Yeah. No, oh, definitely. So let's get into the three sort of strategies that you yeah. put into place and things that you guys took action on during that time. Yeah. These are killer, by the way. And I shared the, I've shared this with you, but one thing that was really big for me when COVID you know, went down is <laughs> you did a webinar and I watched it and I was like, oh man, like you went through these three strategies and it was so helpful for me and my business at that time to think about how I'm adjusting my messaging and what my buyers are thinking about. And it just really help turn my business around and yeah. um, let's share it with, uh, with the yeah. folks watching. So what are maybe the three kind of things and let's dig into it. Well, yeah, let's start with that first one, um, which has everything yeah. to do with that buyer empathy that we as human beings, when there's uncertainty abound, especially economically, we reduce discretionary spend. We look for ways to cut costs and the things that we need, the must haves, and we look to extend our runway is to think about and look at your messaging right now, right? In, in March of 2020, I was telling my clients to go to their website on their, their homepage, whatever their message is. I was literally, I told a couple of them, like, I remember there's a couple of marketers who were like, screw you, Capone. But I was like, go hit select all and then delete. And then rethink your messaging from the lens of what all of your buyers are thinking about right now, which is uncertainty, right? And, and that starts at marketing and starts with your company, but it goes to you as sales professionals that when your lips are moving, those words coming out are the representative of your company, right? And that needs to be hitting the mark around, if there's anything that sounds nice to have or cool in your messaging, great, that can wait. Just like the new couch or the personal trainer, make sure that your messaging is tight around, we're gonna help you reduce cost. We're gonna help you extend your runway. And there's nothing discretionary about that. One, one example, um, there, there's a company called Envoy um, out of San Francisco. Uh, one of my clients, they, um, they're the company that like when you go to an office and let's say you're there to see, see somebody, they're the ones that have like the check-in systems that are at the front desk, right? Where you're just like, um, I'm Todd Capone, I'm here to see Jason, takes my picture, maybe prints off a little badge, but notifies Jason that I'm here. March of 2020 hit, and that's your messaging that you're going to help coordinate the office check-in process. Like, yeah, it, overnight pipeline goes from here to tumbleweed. And so they needed to really go look at that and go, all right, how do we take our solutions and really focus it on the things that people care about? They went and they wiped out their homepage and their, their messaging became all about safety and security and securing that whole process, right? Because they had the technology to do it, whether it's there, there's certain environments and offices that people weren't able to go home, right? There's still shipments that need to be made and things that needed to be delivered somewhere, right? And they were managing that whole process. Their whole office, their whole messaging switched from one day being about office check-ins to the next day being about safety and security and the interactions that you do need to have. And all, they went down to zero and then back up again, right? And they, they laid off some people and then rehired them all. And now they're twice as big. That, that's the way to be thinking about it is your messaging doesn't have to be like, I, I've got a couple other rants on this, but you know, the, one of the, the ones that uh, analogies that I love to give is about the, the, the tennis ball analogy, right? And that one is, like, I don't know if you ever did this, but like in junior high, I remember we were sitting at a table, there was like six of us. And the teacher comes in with a couple of tennis balls, like a sleeve of tennis balls. And she's like, hey, for the next 10 minutes, I want you guys to come up with every potential use for this tennis ball. We're like, all right. We came up with like 40 of them. I, I don't think we even mentioned the idea of playing tennis with it, right? Like it was things like, you know, put it on your walker, uh, put it on, like hang it from your garage so you don't pull the car in too far. Um, you can make a coin person. Like there's a million things. That's the idea. 
think about your solution from the lens of how else could this apply through the lens of what every buyer is experiencing and thinking about right now. That's number one, right? Again, remove all of the discretionary stuff and you might actually open up all kinds of new revenue opportunities as a result of thinking different. If you don't have the answers, guess what? Go talk to your customers, right? Like one of the questions that we used to ask our customers, especially at renewal is, hey, um, like, why did you renew? Like, we think we know, cause we're awesome. But like, why did, why did you renew? And you get, sometimes they're like, oh, cause you guys are awesome. All right, cool. But sometimes you get some really interesting answers that you can use. But then number two is what's one unexpected benefit or value you've gotten from working with us? Like when we pitched you on this solution, now we're a year out, two years out, however long, like what's one thing that you weren't expecting to get as a result of going with us that you've gotten? Sometimes the answer is nothing. That's cool. Sometimes you get some pretty cool answers that also touch at the heart and touch at the personal side that you can use to inform what this down market recession messaging might need to be. Yeah. Okay. There's so much here. So I think I want to give a couple more examples. So one thing I took away from you with this was a lot of my messaging, because I help with outbound was around growing your pipeline. Yes. And what I changed that around was securing your pipeline. You know, and yeah, that awesome. little shift made a huge difference. It's the same outcome. Exactly. You know what I mean? I think that's the thing to point out is that the outcome, the thing that you're helping with is the same, but two things, let me know what you think of this. Two things stuck out to me. One is that I need to connect to what really matters to a buyer, especially an executive VP, C-level. Skip Miller wrote a book called Selling Above and Below the Line that I reference a lot. He talks about these above the line buyers and they care so much more about business outcomes. How is this helping grow top line revenue? How is this helping us reduce unnecessary costs so we can be more profitable? How is this reducing risk, et cetera? And I'm like, those are the things you kind of should be talking about anyways. Yes. You know, yeah. so if you're talking about the nice to have kind of stuff, you should be talking about those anyways. The second thing I thought of, and I had to pull this up because I just started using this stat too, sales loft analyzed 3.4 million cadence steps. Uh, it was like in the last 12 months, 2021 through sometime around this time in 2022. They found that cadence has performed 24% worse from the baseline when they used gain words. So when they said stuff like increase, save, savings, ROI, better, new, quick, guaranteed, that that language just did not work. And I don't know, does that surprise you? No, no. I mean, it's just, again, Me it's, so much of it is at a subconscious level. It, it, that's exactly it. That's amazing. I love the way that you thought about your own messaging too. That that one really hit me. Like, I'm kind of like, that's that's brilliant, right? That in, instead of it, and, and that's the thing, when you go a hundred years back, that in, the, you know, 1919, 1920, every organization was focused on revenue growth at all costs. Come out yeah. the other end, Every company is on this thing called profitability. Huh, who knew that we need to you know, create profitable business for us to be a sustainable. And then all of a sudden it's that for a little while. And then sure enough, we go step on the same rake again and we go revenue at all costs. And then we have an explosion. Like that's, that's the thing that is the, the mistake that I keep seeing us make is that we, we keep going down that path of revenue at all costs. And then it becomes a focus on profitable growth, yeah. right? If there is growth or... You yeah. know, there is a period here where it might be get to certainty and hang on for dear life. Yeah. So it sounds like, again, I just, so just examples for the people watching this, just to make sure I'm tracking with you correctly. So as another example, because I've been working with some clients on this around incorporating more loss aversion into their messaging. So I'm like, don't say that you uh, saved someone 15,000 hours of time by implementing your project management tool tell them that you help them reduce the amount of time they wasted every year by this amount, which was uh, this amount of unnecessary costs. Mm -hmm. Am I thinking again, right there where we're flipping it instead of saving or what they got, it's like what they avoided wasting. Yeah. Is that kind of, what do you think? Well, I have a, I have an opinion on this. That's a little counterintuitive. Sure. Um, yeah. I just, I believe that, you know, from reading the science and behavioral science around all of this, um, we like there, there's always this argument that we are more likely to avoid pain than we are to go towards a reward at, mm -hmm. at a high level. That's true. 
But we're actually more apt to go for a short-term reward than avoid a long-term pain. Yeah. Like, I mean, some of you probably will experiencing that, experience that tomorrow night, right? Like you'll go, I'm drinking tonight, even though Saturday morning, I got to be good. I'll deal with that later. Right. But like, I mean, when you think about it from a vice perspective, but we all do that, I, that our, our perception of a reward is biased by the journey to get there. Meaning if, there, if there's a reward, like we won't always go towards the biggest reward. We'll go towards the reward that's easiest to get to. Because like that gives me some short-term certainty. For like a crazy uh, example of that is um, back in high school, I, I don't want to give anybody PTSD, but I remember like sophomore year of high school, English teacher comes in and she's like, hey, everybody, it's book report time. And they're like, oh, book report, like book reports. They were like the bane. I freaking hated them. And, uh, and she gives us a list of 50 books that are like the classics that we can choose from. What do you do? Right. Like, do you go for the, the book that's going to enrich you the greatest? Like, no. What you're going to do is go, have I read any of these before? No, because I was a dumbass. Um, <laughs> is there a movie about any of these? And like, yeah, about six or seven of them have movies I can go rent uh, to get through part of it. And then it was like, if they're Cliff's Notes, um, like, could I get some Cliff's Notes? And then based on that, I'm like, which one is the most interesting to me? That's how all of your buyers deal with the hundred problems that they're always facing. Every buyer that you've got has got a hundred things they can solve, all of which have an ROI, right? Which is why I don't ever like leading with any kind of ROI, right? Um, uh, instead, no. we choose the four or five that we can actually do something about at a time, right? We can't handle a hundred. We probably pick five. And those five are not always the biggest ROI ones. They are the ones that are the shortest path to the best return, that balance. And so yeah. think about that when you're thinking about your messaging and positioning is we've got to be able to predict. We've got to know that, hey, there's a reward and here's the journey to get to it and let them qualify in or qualify out right away on that. Yeah, what I thought about this from a messaging standpoint is how am I letting people know how I can remove some uncertainty for them? And then it sounds like a hyper focus around sharing insights around how other people are getting quick wins yes. right now is, is really what to focus on. And as a rep, I get you don't really necessarily have as much control over this, but if I'm a sales leader, I'm thinking about our offers mm -hmm. and how do we make sure that we have a good offer that gets the foot in the door with something quick, yeah. something valuable that's really quick so that I'm, you know, kind of, I, I see this. I've seen this more in the last two or three months. A lot of people that are working with me, they'll always use the word like de-risk. We're thinking about how to de-risk this. So here's what we're kind of thinking around. Maybe we don't train the whole team of a hundred at first. Maybe we start with the first 50. Yeah. We see, I'm seeing more of that, you know, kind of stuff. So is that kind of the, where the thinking is there? Yeah, there, there's that. And it's, you know, when you talk about like making it sound quick, like only make it sound quick if it is quick. Uh, number one, yeah. right? Uh, but number two is if your solution is something that takes some effort, set that expectation in the first discussion. Like you've got to yeah. lay that out there um, because if that becomes a surprise, your buyers are going to suddenly go quiet on you. And here's like the, the analogy there, that are hopefully relatable. Um, I'm old. I got uh, kids that are nine and 11. And like the analogy here is we were out shopping my wife leans over and she's like, hey, uh, should we go get some ice cream? Like she kind of whispers it. But my kids in the back seat with their hawk hearing are like, ice cream? Like, ah! like they go crazy. We, uh, here in Chicago area where I live, there's Culver's everywhere. So I don't know if any of you are Culver's fans, but um, they've got the butter burgers, which not my favorite, but they're frozen custard. It's kind of like this creamy ice cream. It's fantastic. It's like tears in the eyes. Good. Well, that's what the kids wanted. Like we're getting... Culver's. So we showed up at the Culver's, right? We were interested. We knew what the reward was. We were there. We had the money in our pocket. But when we get there, there was 14 cars in the drive-thru line, right? So we pull in, we're just like, oh, crap. But we're there. The kids want ice cream. But the amazing thing is even an 11-year-old, my daughter leans forward and she's like, hey, can we just go home? Like, really? And my son's like, yeah, we don't need this now. I, I, I want to get home and play Minecraft, right? 
The point being that then we were like, all right, and we pulled out, we chose the status quo. Now that had everything to do with the journey, right? Because the reward would have been the same. The money was in our pocket. We were there and we disappeared. And I don't know if anybody on the inside's like, what's wrong with them, right? Like, what are they? They showed up, they're wasting our time. Like, no, it's not, it's not us, it's you, right? And that's a lot of what we're doing in our sales efforts is set proper expectation, expectations that you can consistently meet. And like, what I mean by that is like, when you go to an amusement park, let's say you go to Disney in like over spring break, you know, the lines are going to be 45 minutes long. That's your expectation. And you wait, you have no problem with it, but that's the expectation. When expectations are not met or a surprise, that's when people suddenly choose the status quo on you. And oftentimes it's not them, it's you. Yeah. Love it. So second part. Yes. Around firmographic focus. What's, yeah. what's this? Well, this one is, is counterintuitive, right? And this was my strategy in 2008. And for some crazy reason, my CEO went for it. And we grew 400% year over year in the downturn and sold the business to SAP. Here, here's the thing. So when things get tough and we're, we're like our pipeline is not looking so good, our inclination is let's cast a wider net. Like let's go wider. I actually am a firm believer in doing the exact opposite to the point where I call it extreme firmographic focus. There's two reasons, like I'll explain what that is. And there's two reasons why. Extreme firmographic is, uh, focus is look at your current customer base, look at your big wins, look at your case studies, look at your expertise. Where are the opportunities where there's enough, there are higher dollar amounts, your win rate's pretty good and your cycle lengths are pretty good. All right, so look at those and then pick a couple and only focus on those verticals for a short period of time. And here's, here's what I mean. At, uh, I was the SVP of sales for a company called Right Hemisphere. That's the one I, I took through in 2008, 2009 through 2010. We had closed a couple of deals in the aerospace industry. We had a solution that was sold to manufacturers, like what's called discrete manufacturing, which is a bunch of parts go together to make something right? Airplanes, cars, oil rigs, trucks, like that sort of thing. We got a win in aerospace. So I decided that for our team, look at your count list. I want you to prioritize aerospace, aerospace and defense for the next four weeks. That's it. And the reps are like, what the hell? Like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, um, on every sales meeting, we're going to go through every case study that we've got in that industry we're going to hire a external expert in aerospace and defense to come in, teach you everything about it. We're going to talk to our aerospace customers. We're going to bring them in and they're going to tell us what they're worried about, what they think about, what their priorities are, how they're comped, uh, what they read, what their inbox looks like. We're going to educate the crap out of you on aerospace and defense. Next thing you know, we closed Boeing, we closed Gulfstream, we closed Cessna, we closed Northrop Grumman. And all of a sudden, off we go. And then we went slowly wider out. So like my Texas guy was like, hey, oil and gas looks an awful lot like that. Can we do something around oil and gas for me? And like, we got money now, we're not gonna die. So let's hire a consultant to work with you and help you, let's get case studies together. And like, he went out and got Schlumberger and Halliburton. And then in Chicago, the guy was like, can we do the same with heavy manufacturing? We got Caterpillar, we got Deer. And we just went slowly out and that was the magic. Right. So number one, that focus on where we know our messaging really, really works and that we could gain an expertise on it, that first of all, the customers that they were talking to, we were the experts. Like we were coming in with extra knowledge, not trying to sell something. We were ask, like, like we were consultants and advisors to them and, and opening the, their eyes to things that they hadn't even thought about because our sales reps who, you know, they're all ages, right? But they're smart. Number two, so that number one is like you get that expertise and it comes across. But number two is confidence is contagious, all right? Confidence is contagious. And what I mean by that is you go into the forest and there's a bear and they always tell you just like, you know, um, don't, don't, if they sense fear, they can smell fear and they will pounce on that. Well, that's only partially true. We as mammals, as human beings, as like, 
we actually can smell emotion on people. Um, and as a result, that part of our brain lights up. And so when we're talking to somebody who is not confident, who's fearful, that uncertainty part of our brain lights up. And as a result, we become uncertain, in some cases, fearful as well. That's the bear thing, right? A bear can sense that you're fearful, they become fearful. And as a result, they'll fight or flight just like you will, right? Same thing happens on the confidence side. When you run into somebody who's confident, not cocky, that lights up your part of your brain that you become confident and around that individual, but even in yourself. And as a result, confidence becomes contagious. And that's why when you go into a circumstance and you know that you can go toe to toe with a CMO, a head of manufacturing, a CFO, because now you're knowledgeable, not only about what they're dealing with in their life and what their world looks like, but all the things they're measured by and all of those pieces, and you've got the expertise of new ideas that maybe they're not even thinking about, that confidence breeds confidence in them. And it's amazing how all of a sudden our pipeline grew. We were closing deals faster. They were bigger. And we practically saved the company through extreme firmographic focus. And I, don't, I believe that's a strategy that's not reserved for downturns. I think we all should be doing it all the time, but that's just me. Yeah, I love this because... Anyone that's worked with me as a client before knows that the very first thing that I will do is say, hey, you need to pick one ideal client profile and one persona, and we're going to create messaging for that one first. That's the only thing we're going to worry about for like a month, you know, maybe two, one, maybe two. Um, oh, can I add one thing to that? Um, so yeah. like talking to that private equity guy yesterday, and I, we, were, we were going back and forth on this. He's like, hey, you know and you can just Google this, like what industries do well in downturns? Because there are industries that always do well in downturns, right? Insurance, healthcare does well. Uh, CPG typically does pretty well. You still need toilet paper and shampoo and all that stuff, right? Um, like those are opportunity. Uh, it's Stuart um, says alcohol, like I'm thinking about grabbing a drink right now. Um, but like, yeah, like especially during the, uh, the downturn, uh, but, yeah, I mean, you, there's industries that tend to do much better during downturns than others. And as a result, if you're having trouble aligning your messaging and your positioning to your customer base, that's going to be optimal. Choose some of those, pick a couple of them and go, hey, just for a little while, let's just become all out experts in this vertical. Like I did it at, at CRO's power, uh, power Reduce, right? Like we said, we are just doing retailers and brands. And for periods of time, we would do health and beauty. We would do shoe apparel. And all of a sudden my reps are talking about like soul depth on shoes. I'm like, Where'd that, what the hell are you talking about? Like, oh, I was talking like, all of a sudden they're becoming experts on like all things shoe widths and stuff. I'm like, and materials, I'm like that's amazing, right? And that becomes an asset to the people that they're selling to. Yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. There's something that, there's this intangible thing that you're talking about where when a prospect talks to a sales professional that knows all of that little nuance where you immediately demonstrate that you're a peer and a trusted advisor and a consultant mm -hmm. versus someone just trying to hawk something to them. Yeah. And I think that's just so underrated. I, it's like the, the hyper focus, you get something that even when it's not a downturn, you still want that acumen and knowledge. That's the thing I just like, I talk about so much. It, it makes so much of a difference when you're not saying, Hey, I'm reaching out to 12 different verticals right now right. versus pick a couple, you know, and you yeah. sort of answered the second question that I had around who should we focus on? And what that made me think of as a, you know, a sales trainer and coach is, you know, what software companies to focus on that are selling into industries that are not affected. Exactly. So who's selling yeah. to CPG, who's selling into, you know, education's kind of a weird one right now because they have a lot of funding from COVID and that they have to spend this year, yeah. right. you know? So they're doing companies that sell into K through 12 are doing pretty good. You know, that's a really interesting exercise to really go through. Is there any other advice you have around if someone's thinking, how can I bring this extreme, Firmographic focus. Are there any other questions one might ask themselves? Well, I, it all comes down to the four metrics that really drive results, right? And it's a combination of them. It's not them in a, sol a silo. And the four things are the number of opportunities, right? Like, so how much how available of a market is there for this? Number two is the size of opportunities, right? So how big would these tend to be? 
Number three is looking at your current win rates. So do we tend to win a higher percentage of these or not? And then number four is looking at cycle lengths, right? Like are these extended typically that they take longer or do we do these faster? And look at all four of those together and they'll start to inform where you really should focus. I mean, like Jason, for my business, right? Like I, I spend a lot of time with like SaaS tech and, and tech services, like, cause I know there's plenty, they do well, my win rate's really, really high. My cycle lengths are quick. Um, I could, like what I teach, you got a sales team, there's value to that, but I prioritize at a hyper level on the verticals that I do well based on those four categories combined together. And, and that's, yeah. that's really the way that I think about it. I love that. Another thing that you mentioned that I thought was interesting, this is maybe a little harder to pull off as a rep, but the fact that you guys brought in industry experts, I see a companies, a few companies I work with do this, and it is an absolute game changer. When they bring in a consultant that's worked in the industry they sell in for a couple decades, yeah, it, there's just all of this stuff that's just whoa, you know. How do you find people like that? Well, yeah, I mean they're they're around, man. Like it's you can find experts on anything. I remember this dude, yeah. this aerospace dude, like he had like corn stalk ear hair. Like this guy, he had been around for like 70 years. I, I think he might've been 130, but man, was he brilliant. Like he knew the lingo, he knew all the current stuff. He was awesome. Um, and then, but he was pointing us to like, look at these events, follow these people, um, read these, like these publications and go dig into those. And then he would do summaries for us, but you can't yeah. find those. You know where else you can find experts? your customers, right? Like they yeah. wanna see you be successful um, and you'd be surprised. But if the customer is, and the mistake that I see companies do is they'll bring in a customer to tell the reps about how awesome they are, right? Like, oh, we got this much ROI from you and oh, it was great. It was the easiest implementation ever. You know, that's not actually gonna help your salespeople other than to, you know, five-star spew all over customers and people don't buy when there's nothing but five-star reviews. Instead, yeah. like the questions that we would ask would be those things, right? Like, hey, what are your priorities? How are you measured if you're willing to, you know, share that kind of stuff? Um, you know, like what's important to you? What do you read, right? Like where do you go for more information? What, what events do you attend? Like who, like what podcasts are you listening to? And then I, I always used to like to ask, show me your inbox, right? Because your inbox probably is a white noise of, I just wanted to see if you had 15 minutes about like, you know, that crap. Um, like <laughs> what, what are the ones in this inbox that stand out to you that make you want to open them? And when you open them, what are the things that actually intrigue you? And it's amazing. These people are willing to share. They want you to be successful and they hate shitty salespeople just like everybody else does. Right. And they are like, Hey, don't be this dude. Look at this email that I got. What a jackass, right? Like, but they want to help you and they're willing to if you ask them. So industry experts, this thing called Google, like you'd be surprised how quickly you could find them yeah. um, or ask, ask your leaders to ask the board. Like our board was a massive, like it's a, a, our board was made up of investors, but we had a couple of at-large board members who were industry experts. We would bring yeah. them in. There was this woman on Power Reviews' board where I was calling her so much that she was annoyed. But I was like, hey, can you help us with this problem? Can you help us with this? Can you introduce us to these people? There's incredible assets everywhere, all around you. All you got to do is ask. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that because, yeah, there are tons of podcasts, articles. There's all kinds of content out there for just about every industry vertical and yes. people that sort of specialize in those things and customers. Yeah, that's the number one place, if you, especially if you're a sales leader, facilitate a fireside chat or something with one of your customers and record it on Zoom if they're okay with that and invite your sales team, exactly. you know, and do a Q&A, you know, type of thing. Um, okay, third part, I think you might've started talking about already this, this confidence begets confidence part. Is that the third piece to this strategy here? I've kind of gone around because I've got like six, um, but, you know, I okay, think- share something else then if you I, want. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I just- it's confidence begets confidence, but it's about, um, I believe that the future of sales is if salespeople are helping buyers predict instead of trying to convince. I saw like Bajoric just uh, had a post on LinkedIn, I see uh, Jeff's on, um, about like trying to erase 
the word uh, convince from his vernacular, but that's, you know, sales leaders, sales people, your job is not to convince somebody because you, you don't buy when you're convinced. As an individual, if you buy when you're convinced, usually about 20 minutes later, you're like, oh crap. We buy when we can predict, right? And when we do that right, we, you know, we can differentiate our solutions, especially if you're in a kind of a busy market, you can differentiate on your price, your solution, like what little nicks and knacks you've got around, uh, like the, the way that you engage, that kind of stuff. But I think there's a tremendous opportunity to differentiate in the way that you sell. And it goes back to that kind of thing that I was talking about that none of you on this call buy. I, I'll, like, I'll, take, I'll wind that back for a second. As it turns out, when a website is acting as a salesperson, right? When you're going to go buy something online, as it turns out, all of you read reviews, right? Like I haven't found like the 1% that doesn't, but 85% of you go to the negative reviews first, right? So you read the fours, threes, twos, and ones first. And when a product has an average review score between a four, two and a four, five, that is optimal for purchase conversion, right? So we will buy a product that's got negative reviews right under it faster than we will buy a product that's got nothing but perfect five-star reviews. That's when a website's acting as a salesperson. But it turns out that same mindset is exactly what happens in human-to-human -human or B2B selling. Why? Because we at a subconscious level know that perfection does not exist. And we as human beings don't buy until we are comfortable with our prediction of whether the juice is gonna be worth the squeeze. And if we're having a hard time getting at that squeeze information, it slows us down. We do more homework and we lose to the status quo more often. My point here is that this is a perfect opportunity for you to go in and set proper expectations for your customers, do the homework for them. Like we talked about earlier, right? If that journey is really, really long and you're making it hard because you're only sharing perfection, the customer is gonna pull out a line just like we did at Culver's. Do the homework for them. As it turns out, according to Gartner, in a consensus sale, only 39% of the buyer's time is spent talking to you, talking to your competitors, or talking to their internal buying groups. The other 61%, that's doing homework, that's back-channeling you, that's talk, talking to buddies, talking to peers, talk, like reading analyst reviews, going online, and like if you're in tech, they're looking at G2 and Trust Radius. Anywhere else, they're looking at Captera and software advice and Glassdoor. There's reviews everywhere. And you're forcing them to go do that homework, which is the longer line at Culver's, and you lose control. I think at all times, but especially in an economic downturn, do the homework for your customers by leading with what they might not like, right? And I know that sounds crazy, but set proper expectations up front. File what the squeeze is going to be so that they can even file in their brains how great and delicious and nutritious that juice is going to be. And that like the most successful retailers in the world do that incredibly well, right? Like Ikea. You're going to find it. You're going to pick it. You're going to pack it. You're going to shove it in the back of your car. You're going to drive home with a souvenir injury or two. You're going to get it in the house, open the box. There's going to be 150 parts on it with no words on the work instructions under the, other than like Svarta or whatever weird Finnish name they've got. And when you're done, you're going to get modern Scandinavian design furniture that you didn't pay a lot for. And Ikea is the number one furniture retailer in the world for 14 straight years. And it sucks. Costco, like you want some ranch dressing? Here's a gallon. You want a toothbrush? Here's six. Oh, did I mention that you got to pay to even walk in? You need a subscription? And uh, Linda at the door is going to be checking your receipt on the way out to make sure you didn't steal anything. Costco, the number two retailer in the US behind Walmart. We can yeah. all do this because we, when expectations are set accurately and we've like the homework is done, we know what we're getting ourselves into, both the pros and the cons. You'll win faster. You'll win more often. You'll qualify in faster and better. Because if that negative is going to be really, really important, wouldn't you rather know now versus four months from now when you just burned all those cycles and you could have been talking to somebody that is a better opportunity for you? And like I, to that point, lose faster. Like the best thing beyond winning is losing fast. Oh, and the side benefit of that is uh, you make it really hard on your competitors to uh, compete against you too, because they can't even message if you're the one doing the homework for them. So that, that's a bit of a yeah. rant, but the point being, now is the time to do the homework for the buyer, be their Sherpa, instead of convincing, help them predict and do it quickly, whether it's with you or with somebody else.
All right. And that's, that's something that like we all do, you know, Jason, you, me, Bajoric, like we're doing that in our own business. We get a, I get an inbound lead and I know that they're looking for like the kind of prospecting help that you can provide them with. I could do it, but you're like 50 times better than that. I'm pushing that to you. And, and that's the kind of things that we can be doing. Cause otherwise I'm going to spin the drain for a while. And in a downturn, you got to be spending the most precious thing that you've got in your inventory as economically as possible. And that is your time. Lose fast so you can spend time either working the opportunities you should win or prospecting for more that are more in your sweet spot. Love that. So the focus run, adjust your messaging, extreme firmographic focus, and this whole confidence begets confidence. I love the, instead of convincing, you know, really thinking about how do I help the, them predict? It, exactly. It's really comes back to this education and insights type of type of approach. You know, yeah. um, we got a couple more minutes left here. I see a couple questions in the Q and A. If you guys got a question, drop it into the Q and A. We got about five minutes here. Ryan Taylor asks, "What do you think about discounts during oh, a recession? How am that was in my six. Yeah, <laughs> that that's the thing. I, you know, I, it's funny." Um, well, how do I feel about discounts? Like the, the most popular thing I teach is transparent negotiating. Um, but it's it, part of it is this piece of like playing your cards face up and how, you know, confidence begets confidence. But my, my the one little analogy that I want to talk about, Jason, before we got on, we were talking about our dogs. Just re resist the uh, the feeling that you need to give stuff away, right? Just make sure that at your core, you know that every for-profit company in the world cares about four things. How much the customer buys, how fast they pay, how long they commit, and when they sign. That's what your pricing is based on. More than you even know, it's what your compensation plan is based on. It's how your company grows. And it's also how the companies grow that you are selling to. They want customers to buy a lot, pay fast, commit for a long time, and sign whenever the heck they want you to. Hold yeah. firm to that. And that the dog thing is like right outside, like over the, the screen here, I'm looking at my, there's a forest behind us and there's a path. Um, and on the path, I like, I gotta, you can hear my dogs barking right now. Um, when I go take a walk, like, especially if it's rainy out, I just want to get that damn walk done, right? Like, I don't know if you feel that Jason, but it's like, we're going to go on this yep. path. We're going to go and come back. Now imagine I'm walking one of the dogs and the dog pulls me off the path a little bit to do his business. And I look down and under a rock, there's a little piece of paper. I kick it over and it's a $20 bill, right? So what the first thing you do is you're just like, can I, can I keep this? Like, I'm going to keep it. Cool. <laughs> but the second thing you do is your quick path just became jagged because you're going to kick over every single rock now, right? And look and see if there's $20 bills under any of these other ones. Because like that one was too easy. Resist that temptation, right? Your customers, they will be struggling. Some of them will. At renewal time, at new business time, they're asking for discounts. It, trade, right? If they want a discount, trade for commit to more product. Pay us faster. Commit longer. I will pay you for mutual alignment around timing, right? Like you help me forecast, there's value to us. We'll pay you in the form of a discount for that. The minute you give away anything for free, so a customer even asks, hey, we need net 60 payment terms and you Tommy boy. You're like, okie dokie. That's the minute yeah. they just found a $20 bill under a rock and they're like, that was easy. What else can I ask for? <laughs> right? Like, you know, monthly versus annual payments. Uh, will you hold the price to next month? Hey, I need 30% off. Well, I'll give you 10, right? That 10% just became charity to their bottom line and the $20 under the rock. And you just slowed down your deal. You've eroded the value of it and you've made it less predictable. So hold to it. Our pricing is based on these four things. You need something? Cool. Let's talk about where we get those out of these four. And you're, again, confidence begets confidence. But right now, your charitable instinct is there in a down economy, but just don't be giving away stuff for free. I love that advice. I, because I get asked a lot for discounts, just like any smart buyer would. And I learned this from you. I was like, well, if I could get you to pay in full up front, I'm willing to give a discount for that. If we can close this, week if you can yeah. sign this week hey i'm willing to give you a little bit of a discount for that yeah you know well, I just if we had, can commit I, to two deals you know yeah um, i had a huge that company goes. asking me they're like hey our policy's net 60 and i was like all right cool 
as you recall, like my pricing is based on these four things. And if you want next six, you can, but let's look at these four and see where we can kind of pay for that, right? Like I'll pay you for committing to more programs in the form of extended payment terms. I'll pay you for committing to a longer period. I'll pay you for, you know, helping me with my own personal forecast by getting this thing done right away, right? Like, again, doesn't matter what they ask for. If you've got those four internalized, when the bullets start flying, you're never giving away anything for free. You're adding value. You've placed placed your cards up front, face up. Yeah. So for your upsell, your cross sell, and your renewal team, they're going to freaking love you too because it made it so much easier. Yeah. Dude, I've learned so much in this conversation today. <laughs> I'm so grateful for you, man. Um, let us know. I just dropped Chad's uh, Chad Todd's LinkedIn profile into the uh, uh, chat for you. Chat and Todd. I put Chad. You know, connected. Chad, <laughs> That's right. Um, but, uh, yeah, go connect with Todd and Todd, where can people, what do you want people to check out before you take off? This has been really awesome, man. Well, no, I mean, that's, I'm pretty annoyingly everywhere. Like, uh, so I mean, I, but like LinkedIn is a great place. Uh, if you, uh, decide to connect, just let me know where you heard me. That's super helpful so that I can just kind of, uh, cause I get like, you know, it's funny, like email inbox zero, you always get a little endorphin rush. I get one from like yeah. LinkedIn connection request zero too. So like I try to clear them out and it's so hard to decide who's going to slap me as soon as I accept and who is there because yeah. they really want to like partner and, and uh, help each other out. So LinkedIn is a great place. But again, the transparency sale, it's been out for a while. You can get that on Amazon. The transparent sales leader coming out July 5th on Kindle and a short run of paperback and we'll do a full launch in the fall. But uh, yeah, guys, I'm, I'm here to help. So uh, let me know how I can. Awesome. Thank you so much, Todd. Everyone else, thank you so much for the participation. This was, this is a fun one. Have a good rest of your week. We'll see you. Have a good one, everyone. Later.